waiting someone is waiting or no no, no. no i no. don't see i don't see but you are still the host okay i'll make you host and then i'll uh-huh. let me do the sharing na ha uh, kaise bhi yeah main sharing start karke then i'll make you host. okay so okay i'll start now yeah good evening good evening hello <laughs> good evening good evening good evening everyone yeah 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 so i shot i'll i'll start sharing hi raja Ranjan, how do I make make you host? Okay. You don't jack it, Karo. No, my name is in front of you. Ah ha ha. Participants, me. Yeah 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 yeah. Make me hmm. host. Okay, I made you host. Ah. ठीक है. ठीक है. Yeah. Okay. So okay then we start so reimagining art uh so let me talk about the background of this work actually when i studied at nid i became quite aware of this uh, you know what is called as aesthetic sense um uh, because i did engineering and there one was never exposed to anything called beauty art and all that but it was at nid that i first you know confronted this the the the, the need for beauty or to experience to understand beauty um so nid was a fantastic place where you know one had freedom to explore and all that and uh, but there i also became aware that uh, even within that freedom um, our aesthetic sense is being colonized because we are still uh, following the western uh, paradigm of aesthetics of course the whole education is based on the western paradigm but when your aesthetic sense get colonized that is that is a much deeper kind of a melody so that is what really made me explore what is beauty and my whole work uh, you know on on beauty starts from around 1985 and uh, you know which has really made me look very deeply into the issues of beauty development of beauty etc so uh, from nid i actually uh, you know started working with artisans and uh, so that is where i where i began to explore something very radical in the sense that after i realized that they are far more original and it is i who was colonized by the western paradigm i created a method which i call it do nothing method in which of course there was no design no teaching um enabling a space a condition where artisans began to create and uh, i found that they were creating absolutely original and beautiful work of course i'll share with you each of this just to give you a background of the kind of work that i have been doing so artisans gave me a, a possibility of you know one can be original and authentic of course this is against our notion that tradition is always static and uncreative but uh, my experience says the other you know it's the other way then i also started working with children uh initially from the ch- children of the village itself from where i got even deeper understanding about uh, beauty and creativity etc 
um, and uh, then of course I have also worked with uh, regular schools and uh, you know and trying to see how do you relook at this whole idea of art in 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 a school and uh, then I have also spent a few years uh, right now also I am doing that work in design and architectural education in the first year foundation time uh, all the time trying to explore uh, how do you initiate a process where one awakens to one's own authentic sense of beauty. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling this uh, awakening thing primarily because we have not addressed awakening as a, uh, you know, as part of our school itself because schooling is really about conditioning. Uh, so that is why I felt it is very important to say that. So I will share with you the work I have did with traditional potters in Kerala. I'll just show you one example of my work where I call this do nothing method. And uh, what it means is that respect for autonomy, that respect that they have, they have ability and you know, you need to uh, uh, trust them and you know, they will bring out beautiful work. So no teaching, I did not give any tools, no, there were judgments. So, so this is uh, done by that time. I think she was around uh, 18, 18, 19, 20 year old. That is the time when she began to create this uh, work. She has never seen anything called art, sculpture. None of these words are, uh, she has heard. Uh, of course, this, she, they, they belong to a potter's community. So which means that they had clay work. I mean, exposure to clay, but not to any of this kind of work. This is done by 13 year old girls. Each time, this is not mold, each time, uh, you know, hand done. So then in the same village, this is a village near Kerala, in Kerala, near Nilambur. Uh, I also began to work with children during the two months holidays. And I called it sensing nature, knowing nature. Uh, when I got this idea that senses are really important, uh, you know, thing to be looked at. So that is when I created a, you know, a kind of a workshop called Sensing Nature, Knowing Nature. And uh, so there I came across uh, really innocence in children and effortless way they were creating things. Uh, so here also no teaching, no tools, no judgments. Uh, so this was the same procedure that I undertook. Uh, so before the workshop, we all sit together, sit for some time, sit in silence just listening to the birds and different, different sound that is happening. And, uh, and, and basically the work was related to uh, connecting children with various aspects of nature. And uh, so you can see the kind of uh, fine tuning that happens when one really explores, explore nature around. And, uh, uh, you know, just the range of green that, are, that is available in nature. Uh, so she was actually collecting this and then recreating it in, you know, you know, to understand the color shades. So here you can see the original, uh, you know, set on the left and the uh, and the color on the right. And mind you, we were only using the primary colors. That's all. So the child was actually mixing and making all these colors. We were using red, black, blue, yellow, white, and green. This is all. Only the six poster colors were used, but children were totally on their own making these things. And then we were looking at, you know, dry leaves and whatever was around to replicate. And there was hardly any facility because, you know, every time we think of facilities first. So here I want to show you that there was hardly any facility. We were sitting here and there under the tree, somebody's veranda and all that and uh, doing all these things. And none of the children had any complaint about any of that. So this is a, you know, I started this in 2003 and it went on for a few years. 
um, April, May holidays is the time when I was doing that. And you can see absolutely beautiful and original work children were able to create in that. And there was also some clay work. So, and actually the whole idea was to look around in the village and recreate. So whether they were doing color work or drawings or anything, it was basically looking at nature around what is around you and then recreating it. Uh, then we also later we also introduced stitching, but stitching is not in the regular sense. We were treating it more like a drawing in the sense that, and again, there was no teaching at all. So running stitch is the easiest thing. It's like drawing a line. And so there wasn't any teaching, just materials were provided and then they began to create stuff. Mm, this is just using dry leaves. Now this age group is from eight to 13, 14. That is the uh, age group in this work. And also there was one group that was uh, using old magazines and creating, you know, absolutely beautiful and stunning work. Uh, and every time it was pointing out that something was already within us, because if there is no teaching and if children are creating absolutely beautiful stuff, which actually means that this is, you know, somewhere connected with our biology, you know, of course, this we will go into this little later into this biological roots of beauty. Now, this is by collecting, uh, you know, different kinds of mud and, uh, you know, stones that are in, in the vicinity, crushing it and making color powder and then creating a beautiful column. Uh, so then I will also share with you some of the work that I did in certain schools, different schools in different parts of the country. Uh, normally, I work with uh, teachers and uh, to to you know to enable them to understand this process but once in a while i also work with children to really reaffirm reconfirm my trust in children and so i have worked both in urban type of schools and truly rural schools of course there are differences there because uh, of in the work i will show you that again here the idea is to initiate process no teaching and of course, certain habits needed to be changed because in the schools, they're already been conditioned in certain ways, certain habits have been put into place. So that was very important. And one very important thing that I always introduce is that, uh, you know, children work together. So it's not one drawing and one, you know, signature down. So uh, again, this is another thing that we unnecessarily condition children to, uh, you know, unwanted ego gets built up when you, you know, because actually uh, this beauty is created because of a certain deeper kind of a connect. Uh, so I normally use either observation or recollection uh, as the basic uh, format in, in, you know, in, in developing work, uh, observation of the you know, nearby places, and simple, simple things that normally you don't even notice. No? That kind of simple objects go around, collect, and then start. So which actually what this does is that the child then is always attentive to the surroundings. So this is a very good example. Just we took creeper as an example. And then uh, all kinds of creepers. And mind you that, you know, even though something maybe, you know, you, you may not agree with what I've drawn, I normally don't get into correction because I think the child is uh, in the process will do self-correction. Um, so I would leave it at that normally. So this is in another school where uh, children were going around and looking at different shapes of leaves. Then uh, this was again a recollecting recollection exercise. Um, I asked them to make, uh, you know, create drawing of what they ate that day and how that whole scenario, how that process was happening, you know. So one of the very in, important thing in this working with this, this was in a rural place near Bangalore, near Kopam, um, Kupam, uh, where I was working with uh, 
rural children. And what was very interesting was that this was eight standard students and not one child told me that they don't know how to draw. And it was so interesting if you look at this drawing, the, the human being is not there. And he managed the whole drawing with two hands. And the mother is represented with two bangles. So, uh, so this is so interesting that nobody ever felt that they don't know how to draw. Uh, because this is what is very, very uh, common in most of the urban schools where 70% of the children say they don't know how to draw by the time they reach fifth standard, sixth standard. And you know, by the time, of course, eight, nine, ten, the, the class itself may not be there. Uh, so this was again a recollection of farming. In the rural context, this is extremely important because this gives them an opportunity to revisit, reflect, <clears throat> remember how things are happening around them. Because what is really happening in the modern schooling system is that you are totally disconnected from your actual context, actual surroundings, and then you get trapped in books. So I was basically using this at least to remind them that, you know, that these things were there. And so it was very interesting how um, children came up with all their experiences in, in these things, you know. So important thing was that nobody complained that uh, they didn't know how to draw. And I was using this as a means to connect with their context, especially their traditional knowledge about farming, cooking, and you know, all those kind of things. And uh, so from this, I, I have felt that drawing is one of the most important activity that needs to be cultivated because drawing, uh, natural drawing can only happen if through observation. So I will share some work with, uh, you know, what I have done with design and architecture students. Um, this work in, in the design and architectural education, the first year is called foundation year. And in foundation year, uh, one shift that I've made is that there are a lot of wrong cognitive and psychological habits that children, uh, students acquire by then uh, because they reach by 17, 18 years. So 17 years of conditioning that has happened. So the initial phase is to break many of these habits and make them more independent, more autonomous, and, you know, and enable them to take self initiative and things like that, which is normally dead by the time they reach, uh, you know, that age. So initiating a process, but again, I continue with my do nothing method, creating an environment where they begin to explore. Uh, of course, in, 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 as you grow older, this becomes more and more difficult. With children, it is so easy because they, they, are, they are naturally inclined for that. So here again, as you can see, the idea is that people begin to observe absolutely mundane things in life. And, and then what happens is that as you begin to observe this, slowly, 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 you find that everything around you is really beautiful. So the whole idea is to awaken a sense of beauty that, uh, that at certain point, it becomes almost choiceless. Of course, this can only happen if you are truly engaging with things around observing connecting with them, you know. So just a wooden piece became a beautiful work. You know, dry leaves. This is from all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, color in uh, leaves in different, you know, stages. You can get a fantastic color range just in this. Again, looking at normal, ordinary, mundane stuff and recreating that. So drawing, again, picking up real leaves, observing very well and drawing. Uh, grass being drawn. So here, you know, see the most important thing is that in hardly in any, uh, any schools or any attempt in art, that encouragement of observation is hardly ever done, you know, to do day to day normal things, you know, normally because when you say that you draw something, immediately the idea is to draw a flower or something like that. No, not to the, you know, this uh, day to day objects that you seeing around. So here I would like to stress one very important idea. So initially I was looking at decolonization of beauty, 
which then slowly, slowly turned into looking at biological roots of beauty, which is actually far more deeper than the issue of decolonization. Once you understand it is rooted in your biology, then you can bypass the issue of decolonization and directly begin to address the, you know, awakening what is already ingrained in you. So this happened because I have been uh, looking around in the rural travel areas where I find that whatever people do is beautiful. Uh, for example, in this case, the ch this lady had done this circular, uh, you know, tray with no support at all, with nothing as a template. She was just able to do it. And I have repeatedly seen this happening. I remember seeing a lady, you know, cutting out clay slab with a knife, just scooping out and making beautiful circular slabs. And this, I, I was, uh, you know, astonished because in, at, when I was studying at NID uh, in the first year that uh, in, in our foundation year, we spend almost every day morning drawing circles and lines, you know, freehand as if training how to draw circles. And when I go to the villages, I find that they just do it so simply. So that is what actually made me look at that. Why, how is it possible that people are, you know, uh, just doing whatever they are doing and it is turning out to be beautiful. That is when I began to see that there is an urge for order, which is deeply in, ingrained in our being. And of course it has to remain in a, in a quite like a, uh, at a subconscious level, uh, because it is, you know, if you disturb it, maybe there could be some problem. Uh, otherwise it is, if you don't disturb it, it you, what you do is turn, turns out to be beautiful. You know? So this is, I want to show you an example that, you know, when you see something like this, slightly bent, is there a tendency in us to keep it straight? Like, for example, you may, uh, you know, when you are, the doormat, for example, that's a good example. Normally you see, it, uh, you know, slightly bend and, you know, immediately you feel like making it right. So where does this uh, urge comes from? Um, so let me share with you a fantastic video. Uh, please look at this, this girl who, who is, uh, you know, who is, uh, uh, just see her, what she's doing. And see the other child also joins in the process. So where does this urge comes from? Uh, so this is what I felt that you know because there is a pattern that is emerging in wherever you go you find this kind of uh, 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 urge for balance, urge for order, rhythm, uh, you know something that is uh, part and parcel of our uh, being actually and also when you look at something beautiful uh, for example I showed you earlier this composition uh, later I began to realize that this is maybe because it it actually demands least uh, effort from our uh, for us to see that something that is well composed meaning it demands least effort from us uh, you know could be so there is a natural urge in composing it in certain way that it becomes, you know, beauty is actually a result of that. Beauty is not, uh, you know, uh, not that we start with actually. So then I also began to look at rhythm and body uh, in, in the same aspect. Uh, let me just share uh, the sound. How do I share the sound? Can you see it? No, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. Okay, okay. I think I have to reshare it. Just give me one minute. And uh, down there, sound, um, sharing sound. Ranjana, you have to give me permission. Okay. Share permission. Okay, I have to... Yeah. 
Just give me one minute. I have to look for the sound. Share. Okay, okay. Share computer sound. Okay, I found it. Okay, now. You you heard it now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. You can see every time there is something that is so beautiful about everything that people do. So look at the rhythm that the people are the, the the you know the rhythm that they are able to keep. No, they are not talking to each other, but somehow so this is a, just look at the person how he is handling that uh, that net. one action so another thing that you find is that there's a tendency for conservation of energy now this is these are very natural in the body um, so that is what so now based on this uh, you know actually we are proposing a certain kind of a uh, you know online course a 10 day course to uh, to, to actually see, first of all, to see whether uh, we ourselves can develop, uh, you know, this natural aesthetic sense, and then also learn how do we work with in our respective places. So the primary interest is to for us to develop aesthetic sense and, uh, and open to anybody, and especially those who are afraid of art. That's a very important thing because, uh, you know, like the way we are afraid of mathematics, there are also a whole lot of people who are afraid of art. So, but this is far more deeper in our being that, uh, so actually uh, one important thing that we have to look at is how do we integrate art and science? Because the what happens when we reimagine art in a manner that I'm talking about is that observation becomes the key aspect that it is, uh, you know, because without observation, none of, neither art can happen nor science can happen. But even, but within our modern educational framework, there is no space for observation at all. So, uh, drawing is a fantastic, uh, you know, tool to start initiating this process. So naturally, awakening and development of senses will happen the moment you shift, do this. Uh, and of course, your development of cognitive qualities and abilities, development of aesthetic qualities and abilities, and uh, integration of cognitive and aesthetic system. Because actually, these are not two different things. Uh, but in the modern educational context, you have created all this into different compartments, uh, and they don't meet each other. Mind you, actually, in the um, if you look at the bifurcation that has happened, it's a very recent phenomenon actually. This art and science has two separate things. And of course, you can look at that, understand that whatever we are following today stems from Western culture. And within the Western culture, this bifurcation took place in the 18th century. Uh, when people like Leonardo and all were doing, they were actually, there was no division between art and science. So up to 17th century, there was hardly any difference. And what is even more important is that the idea of uh, self-expression, even that begins at a much, much later date, you know, 18th, 19th century is the time when self-expression began to emerge. 
And as you can see that in the modern context, art has become more like a mental construct. Um, that is how we, we forgot that it is part of our biological system, you know. So uh, why do I say art, integration of art and sciences? Because experience is the basis for both knowledge and science, you know, of art. So the moment you begin to explore, uh, that you begin to experience. So experience becomes the base in which, uh, you know, oh, oh, that, that becomes the basis from which both art and science can be understood. No? So in this case, so when you're directly engaging, children get rooted to their context, extremely important because that is not what is happening today. And so the act, primary act is drawing and then slowly take into painting because painting is, uh, I, what I, we have felt is that painting should not be introduced right in the beginning because uh, when children are introduced to paint, they will start exploring paint rather than the nature outside. So this is another important thing that we need to do is to decompartmentalize art, that we have created all kinds of different kinds of art forms. And uh, so these are all put in compartments, you know, theater is one, music is something else, drawing is something else. So basically it is all about sense. So how do we, especially in the, you know, lower classes up to eighth standard, at least, you know, if one need not fragment this into different, different subjects, uh, because, you know, rather than teaching skills to sing, paint, draw, what needs to be done is to, to awaken their ability to see, to hear, to observe, to feel, to touch, you know. So this would actually shift the whole focus into uh, something else, not to the product, end product. So here you can see one very interesting activity in which the, how children are free from our categories. <laughs> So here you can see playing and drawing are combined together. Because normally when we think of drawing, we immediately think of a small paper in which we are drawing, you know, where things are given and that's the whole thing, you know. Uh, but actually children don't belong to that category at all. That They don't have this kind of fragments that we have created. Uh, so there are certain fundamental shifts that has to happen. One that we have to stop focusing on skill and shift into quality because skill is something that will happen anyway. Uh, but quality is like observation. Um, because the moment you focus on observation, attention, patience, interest, all that will follow as a result of that. So, uh, you know, imagine something like this. Uh, you know, this is what you see here is a, uh, a windshield. And can anybody even think that windshield can become a subject for drawing? I don't think any artist would even ever think of drawing a windshield, you know. But for a child, you know, so that is where we, it's very clear that children are not looking at this as an art form, but to enhance observation. Look at different kinds of uh, windshields that he has drawn. And in fact, we have a book, a 200 page book, this child has drawn only on different types of windshields. Yeah? And you can see how the uh, details are getting fine-tuned. Here you can see the, the, the movement of the wiper. So in fact, you can, from this it is very clear that child is combining science and art. He is using this as a means to really explore, to observe how things are happening around. And you can also see how complexity gets increased and in fact, he had another 200 page book only on this vehicles that, you know, that he has been uh, observing different types of vehicles. So this is another very important thing to understand that how children draw from two dimension to three dimension. You can see that, you know, how from a line drawing, how the progression happens, get it into 3D. And at some point, even the child has drawn a top view. This is absolutely unusual kind of thing. And all this kind of says that it is to enhance observation that children do this, you know.
So again, art is a product into process because normally we see, uh, you know, again, as, uh, what I told you as compartments and, um, and, and actually nature is absolutely beautiful. And, uh, but I don't know how much, how many, how much, how, how many of us are actually utilizing that opportunity to reconnect with ours, with our own connection and then enabling the child to connect with this beauty of nature. So, uh, and, and then another very important shift that has to happen is that from known to unknown, uh, because we are actually using very ready-made solutions and ready-made things for drawing and, and coloring and all these kind of things, which actually kills the true possibility of awakening of creativity. Um, because the moment you go in section, the moment you have ready-made things, the possibility of engaging with the unknown is completely lost because creativity is something that happens when, it, when, you, when faced with unknown. So every child is potentially creative, but unfortunately, because we are constantly dealing with the known and constantly into teaching, that possibility of awakening that creative potential is killed. And uh, another thing is to move from teaching into awakening, because the moment you stop teaching, you are respecting the child's autonomy. Uh, naturally, the child begins to take responsibility and this also ensures that the teacher become a co-creator and uh, and a learner along with the children because see what is one very important thing to understand is that children actually learn the teacher so if the if the child if you want the child to be a learner then the teacher should be change their behavior into that of a learner because if you are teaching all the time the child will learn to teach. That is why you find children when they go home, play teacher games. You have you've hardly observed them experimenting what the teacher has done in the class or exploring what the teacher is doing in the class or any time felt that the teacher don't know anything and the teacher is trying to understand. So there is a very clear cut uh, role that we have defined which is absolutely harmful for our being because we need to always pretend that we know everything which is absolutely harmful for a to, in, to create an environment of learning so the objective is to retain the artist and scientist in every child uh, Ranjana, somebody there's too much noise happening there can you mute okay okay i will do that Have you muted, muted me also? No, no. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. So retaining uh, and creating situations for development of the senses, especially observation, explore various aspects of nature. You know, it could be color, texture, line, shape, you know, everything that is around that you can explore. Then this is another really important thing because, uh, you know, what what the school does is to shift the attention from the real world into the printed world. So this is a very, very important shift that we can make through this. So the child becomes aware of the social world, the cultural world and the natural world that are happening around them. And, uh, and, and to open up the cognitive potential of drawing because again, here the focus has to be drawing. And we will explain that, you know, in the, uh, in the class actually. So the course will address the role of senses in the development of beauty, enabling development of natural rhythm in children, cognitive importance of drawing, how to enable situations, how important not to judge. So, uh, you know, some of these things that we will address in the class and course highlight will be Enabling the artist within you. This is the most crucial thing because unless you awaken your sensibility, the uh, the what do you call that? You won't be able to help children at all. And and sorry to say that the Google didn't help me to correct the spelling. 
uh, and the course will be ex non expert dependent so it will be an exploratory kind of a process in which we work together and you know of course certain kind of guidance would be given because probably you are entering into a new world new exploratory ways uh, so one important thing that we need to understand is that uh, you know the fear of art is as prevalent as mathematics but we have uh, and also but we normally talk about fear of mathematics because we have hardly given importance to art um and actually the reason is that both as even mathematics can be understood from uh, the way that i am talking about that we can understand art from its biological basis i am also proposing that mathematics also could be understood from a more of a, a biological uh, roots of this you know uh, so this is some because actually you can understand that mathematics stems from quantification and measurement which actually we are constantly doing we, we just that we don't have any number for that our senses are constantly assessing calculating measuring judging this is what we are doing all the time just that the number is not there and now if you just recollect whatever you have been you do in the kitchen it is all about sensing so actually we are always doing subconscious mathematics all the time uh it's like this that uh, you no know, so the way we learned mother tongue without having any clue about grammar that's how it is actually in fact without grammar you can't speak properly but grammar was so implicit in this that without making an effort to grammar separately we began to handle language very well precisely this is the way that we need to relook at this whole educational paradigm because implicitly we are able to understand everything but somewhere we are making a mess of everything because we are not respecting that implicitly we all know things and it is about art articulating what we implicitly know you know so so what is the biological root of art that is something that we need to explore what i mean by biological root is like the way hunger is the biological root for food you know you make food but the root is that hunger uh, that is what enables you to make this and precisely there is something of you know uh, that we create order rhythm and all that something beautiful because there is something that is deeply ingrained in us you know? let me share with you one beautiful video um and please uh, uh, you know pay attention to what the child is doing uh, you know so pay attention to what the child is doing just in the hand pay attention to the hand
So, uh, so the same thing can be done with music, dance, theater, every other, uh, you know, so-called art forms can be looked at in the, exactly in the same manner because all this actually stems from observation of things around and something that is innate in us. So these are the two things that, uh, you know, and uh, so beauty is an integral aspect of life. It is rooted in the organizational principle of life, how things happen, how things are formed and the operational principle of life. So with this, I end my presentation. We will have a, you know, 10, 15 minutes discussion. If you feel like this is the contact email and uh, website. All right, you can open your, uh, the, what do you call that? Video at least. You can keep the other thing on the, oh. Sir, good evening. Ah. Who is this? Yes, sir. Varlakshmi from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. From Andhra Pradesh. Hmm. Yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, three years before uh, we attended your workshop, which was conducted in Chennai, huh. Theosophical Society. Huh. Yeah. So we are very fortunate again to be part of your program. Yeah. So as, as I attended that program, so I very clearly I understood this. Yeah, I, I broadened, broadened, broadly I understood. Yeah, we, can, we came there for three days. So I easily understood uh, today's uh, session. Okay, yeah. And we in the school are, uh, uh, we in the school are uh, very much trying and doing uh, in this uh, experiential learning, especially I'm a mathematics, mathematics teacher hmm. and so I'm taking cooking as a part and uh, how uh, Max can be connected in that and how to take to field trips and how can Max be learned in a contextual way. So in this way, uh, I'm doing and children are learning the best. Yeah, as they are, the, it is urban school. So giving those experiences and exposure, children are able to uh, implement to their day-to-day -day life what they are learning from the textbook, which is very important. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. Divya. Uh, I uh, wanted to share, yes, Divya from Tamil Nadu, he wrote. Hmm. I have attended your workshop. I wanted to share my experience as your student. You know, like, uh, uh, I think, Divya, there is some problem with your, not clear at all, Divya. Can you hear me? Uh, try again. Once Can again. you hear me? Yes. Uh, I am a no. No, no, no. Lost you. Hello. Ah, who is that? Shwani. Yeah, ah. my name is Shivani. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to understand, right? I mean, you mentioned like first it should be introduced to drawing and only then painting. Ha, uh, ha. Like what's, uh, when you say only then painting, right? What would be a good age? Or is it not age dependent? Or, no, I'll, uh, I'll tell you the first, let me tell you the logic of that. Na? Yeah. 
uh, you see, it's like this. When you give toy to a child, yeah. the child will start playing with the toy. Hmm. If you don't give a toy to the child, make the a child's attention will be exploring the real world hmm. and in the process of understanding the real world, will recreate certain object that resemble hmm. the real world. Mm -hmm. So the child actually doesn't require toy at all. Toy is a modern construct. Children doesn't need toys at all. Children actually, what children do is that when they are exploring the real world, mm -hmm. when they want to, for example, when they want to play, uh, you know, train, they would mm -hmm. put a series of chairs together and say that is their train. Mm -hmm. The same chair will become something else, something else. It can become a house. Mm. So, so whatever child wants to do, at that point, they will use something that is around and you understand, no? Yeah, so the me. moment, got so the toy is actually a very dangerous thing. If you give toy, then the focus, the whole ability, the quality and the, the need, everything you are shifting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, it is then, then you are making that into a play. Otherwise, play was a cognitive activity. Toy was a, that object was a means to understand the real world. Mm, mm, Similarly, mm. Uh, see, drawing is actually least, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't actually harm in that way to a child. For example, if you give children pencil, initially mm. they would play with it. They would, you know, if you give a cutter and pencil, they would start playing with it. Because first mm. thing they want to do is to understand what is that material. Yeah. Understand? Huh? So the moment they are okay with that, then they start drawing lines and you will find that the drawing that children do is actually representing the real world. If you don't interfere and if you don't teach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the moment you give color to children, they will start playing with color. So that will become like the way we have given toy. Then the paint will become something to explore the paint itself. Paint is then no longer a means to understand something else. Mm -hmm. When you are adding a new activity to a child. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, when you give eraser to a child, mm -hmm. for you, it is an eraser. It is for mm -hmm. erasing. Mm -hmm. For a child, it is a material. It's a new material that can, that has some, some lots of other properties. Mm -hmm. The child will rub, keep rubbing the eraser and make it as small as possible. So they are not doing it to erase something. Mm. They are exploring that material. You see the difference? Yeah. Similarly, when you, so children are actually exploring the real world. The real world means how it looks. For example, let me take a phone and show you. Looking a real world means how does it look like? Mm -hmm. With what material it is made? What mm. is the function? How is it made? So mm -hmm. for every myth, every aspect, you can find these four or five things. And this is actually what children are, what we call as play, is nothing but recreation of all this. Mm -hmm. For example, you must have seen how a child uses the palm as mobile phone. Have you seen that? Yes. Little children. So they don't need a mobile phone. You don't have to buy a toy mobile phone for the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understand? Nah? So similarly, when we give, for example, you give crayons to a child, what would the child do? They will crush it and they will use it for something. Mm -hmm. So what you're then doing is that, of course, it is okay to, as a material to explore. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is that things that are co fundamentally cognitive in nature become something else altogether. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Understand that. So, as I was telling, mm -hmm. art as a separate activity again is a modern construct. In in tradition, in rural tribal communities, and even in tradition, even up before the 17th century, it was an activity that people did. Yeah. You know, it was like a, in the way you would respect a barber who is good in shaving. You would have a skilled person who can draw. You didn't huh. have a, the kind of uh, image that has been created in the modern context. You know. It was never there. It was a skill. Mm -hmm. Understand? Huh? Mm -hmm. So it is after the 18th century, self-expression came in, individuality came in, ego came in, you know, this whole 
shift towards the individual is what has uh, resulted in these kind of things you know so so drawing is a much more uh, a tool that can help children to understand the three dimensional world in terms of two dimensional space mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so maybe at a later stage uh, children could use color i don't know see this is something that we need to explore together i am you know just that i have you know see, this area is something that very very few people have explored Mm -hmm. Most of the exploration is on how to teach children and every drama that happens is how to teach them better, how to teach them under the tree, how to, you know, make them this, make them that. There is no attempt to understand what would children do on their own. Mm -hmm. There is no attempt to understand that children are actually learning the world because they are born to learn, they are biologically equipped to learn and how do you enable environment for that? None of this has been explored so far. Mm -hmm. So it is important that people who really want to understand the damages of schooling, how to, uh, you know, create a better environment for our lives, we mm -hmm. need to, you know, come together and start an exploratory process, you know. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anjana. And you tell. Sir, I was... Yeah, Can you hear me? Yes. Anjana, Anjana is asking. Anjana, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I was wondering how do we unlearn all that in just, you know, a uh, few sessions? Because I understand what you're saying. Like, uh, we already know cognitively, okay, this is a phone and this is what we do with it, or this is an yeah. erector and this is what we do with it. So, how do we unlearn that? And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only children can help you do this. <laughs> Only children can help. And, and also, if we can completely keep our hands off with them. See, the problem is that we are already trained to help them out, you know, <laughs> that's a tragedy. <laughs> we need to stop helping them. We need to begin to respect life at a very fundamental level. Then only we will, then they will, you see, I have to repeat one story. You know, there's something that tell everybody, I happen to adopt a child. Then I put three rules to my life. One, never say no to her, always follow her, never lie to her. Actually, these three things enabled her to reveal herself to me that this is what I am, you know. <laughs> see, this is what it is. So we need to, uh, you know, see, I can, I am very firm that if the whole de-schooling can only begin if we can really encounter somebody who is not schooled. See, all the drama that we urban people do on de-schooling, unlearning, this is all utter nonsense. We are just making up a, you know, another, another story. Unless we encounter true life, true possibility of learning. So it can be rural level people who are not schooled at all. It can be tree, it can be animals. Because every living being is learning. It is only the modern educated who have stopped learning and pretending they are learning. Because learning is not analyzing somebody's information. Isn't that we have been doing all this while? Yeah. So learning actually means creation of knowledge. Creation of knowledge means we are observant, our senses are functioning, there is autonomy. Okay. Okay, Arijit. Yeah, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for uh, your insights, fantastic insights. I just have a small clarification to make. You said that uh, to leave children alone, which is fantastic, which I also personally agree to and, and, and not to uh, judge them as well. Yes. What is your take on um, peer feedback? So same age children giving. No, no. that's a different thing. Working, working collaboratively. Yeah, and, and no, helping each other out. Yeah. See, normally, if you look at a rural situation, always children are together. Two minutes. And always in different age groups. Unlike our school system, we have only one age group. This is absolutely, you know, unscientific way of putting children together. There's no, there is no peer learning at all possible when you have the same age group children working together. True. So you go to any village situation, you will find two, three kinds of groupings. Up to the age of six, seven, eight, you know, there is one group that will happen. From eight, nine to 12, 13, there will be another group. After 13, there is another group because each time the, you know, of course, these, these also mingle together, but you will more or less, you find this kind of groupings all the time together. 
and you will always find that it is always a guru shishya parampara that is carried out every time a 6 year old will have four four year old and five year olds as their chelas and the six the same six year old will become a, a chela of another guru who is seven year old eight year old you know so this is a continuous kind of thing that happens in a you know so peer learning is very important what is really dangerous in modern situation is that children don't have peers at all even in, in our home we have only one child which is the worst crime we can commit to a child i think every family should have at least three children three child is a must if not more no problem but no not less than three because only that can become a fantastic group you know supporting each other but of course you you can spoil all the three also <laughs> <laughs> So That's true. Thank you. Oil brats, but you know. <laughs> so, so Thank you whole, very much. Now the whole issue is the moment we begin to respect autonomy, we stop spoiling them. That is to be understood. It is by taking away autonomy, creating dependence that you and we actually creating dependence means creating ego. The moment you begin to respect autonomy, then you are not touching the ego of the child. So that is the basic. Uh, thank you hi jinan hi a practical question about the course um how how does it how is it going to pan out is it the meet the zoom meeting theoretical and we um, no very less theoretical around? okay so are we like doing things at home and then we share or yes 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 so so the kind of work that i shared with you that is what i normally do in uh in okay. various you know whether it is design school or whether it is the working with children there is absolutely no teaching at all but when we are dealing with when we are when we are engaging together older people then of course we can converse certain things you know normally i don't discuss anything with children because they are already doing it they are even better than you what are they to teach them what are they to tell them so you know you actually you know create more environment possibilities for them to explore for us of course there is a problem of de schooling and learning you know so would we be touching on those subjects absolutely absolutely so this is more like an de schooling and learning kind of an exercise you know see basically we are mind people we have never understood our bodies our senses have never worked so when what i talk about art is that it is more an experiential it's not a mental idea but modernity has shifted that into a mind idea so we need to get it out from the mind and you know begin to explore with our heart heart doesn't think but it can feel it can sense you know it can fall in love beauty is about love you know falling in love with nature you know so that is the shift that you know that uh, so but this time you know I, i'm hoping that uh we will do it you know every alternate days you know starting on 24th 26 28 like that you know 10 days and we'll see how it works out so personally for me i i i had stopped reading for quite some time and i my thinking mind stopped working after i started working with those children i showed you that sensing nature workshop so in 2000 or around that time uh, i i was also present in the two months with children and i found that that you know because every day i was i began to observe and everything began to be i began to notice everything that is around so if you can do that for some time you know one month two month three months observing nature and slowly that becomes choiceless now we have to make an effort to look because our you know whole schooling what it does is to numb your senses our eyes are now tools of the mind it is no longer physiological tool it's always thinking tool <coughs> reading is a thinking activity na no? reading is not a physiological activity when you are reading you are actually thinking so you are actually converted your eye for a as a tool of the mind so how do we get it back as a tool of the body is the issue and true experience like this in you know, an experience of beauty in nature 
can help us to you know to get rooted again and become present we don't have to then do meditation and things like i think you know because then you are all the time meditating almost you know because you are present you are seeing everything nothing is you don't you know everything get noticed that's the thing anybody else Yeah, sir. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Otherwise, I type in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. Am I audible? No, no. Again, problem. Dilipa wants to say something. Dilipa. Okay. No. Okay. Somebody. Oh, I want to know one thing. Um, huh? See, like when, uh, like hmm. when I'm listening to you, right? I mean, it almost feels reading to kids also is not that great an idea because you are kind of killing their. original ideas or I minute mean, that's how it comes to me at least now right but what i feel is it is also a way of introducing them to uh, many other ideas and i also feel i mean uh, introducing to more ideas leads leads to more discussions like similarly for colors like the example you gave that they start exploring the colors so i don't say that we give them all kind of fancy colors or everything but basic colors i feel i mean uh, so i feel i mean when we give very basic colors to a kid uh, that kind of does good to them it, that is that has at least been my observation with my kid um like very basic colors right i felt uh, the way they started color coordinating things i mean i i could not do it that way the way they were uh, she was doing right so i at least felt that it was doing good to her i i never felt uh, i agree on a lot of fancy things should not be given but uh, but again i mean uh, the more opportunities we we provide it leads to more discussions and then more thinking right isn't that good i mean i'm confused there a little bit uh, in the i think i think it's good to stay confused let's not get into a, you know i don't agree with you but let's not discuss too much you uh-huh. observe 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 and then see if you can figure it out you know sure that may be better you no know? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jinan. Hi, Raja. You no, know, I have a class in the morning tomorrow. Huh? Oh, huh. graduate students who want to learn many things about images, and uh, well, I must say it was nice to speak to you because uh, I was trying to figure out what I should be doing with postgraduate students. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to do nothing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Okay, then I hope uh, we call it today. Yeah. So thank you very for good, coming, Philip. Huh? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. It's a very good you. beginning. Yeah. 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 And oh. look forward to the whole program now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Yeah. So thank you very much. thank you thank you thank you jina thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you thank you jina okay thank you bye so bye bye